Good morning to you, my friends, wherever you may be in the world today. Alan Clements here from uh, Maui, the occupied islands of Hawaii by the United States. Today, September 13, 2021, uh, a topic that was quite spontaneously felt, uh, averting overwhelm, if there is any interest. Um, I was going to write how I'm averting overwhelm. It's, it's both comedic and wickedly satirical. Um, to feel into my own circumstances you know, walking around, uh, being told that I could die at any second, and you too. And within that, this, this holding back the psychological, emotional sense field of anticipating catastrophe, <laughs> you know, Death is one thing, but dying is another, and dying with searing, outrageous sensations of anguish is another thing altogether. You know, whoosh, the entire planet explodes into an extinction moment. I don't know what your anticipations are, whatever horror movies you watch. But this issue of averting overwhelm, I'd like to just play in it a little bit with you. Um, I mean, there's so much information, there's so much misinformation, there's so many comparisons today of what we're perceiving among many with the authoritarianism, the decrees even of a president, the dictatorial, you know, overlording demands, mandatory, mandatory. I don't know about you, but I, I grew up to disobey mandatory, disobey demands upon my sovereignty, even as a child. Um, I guess that's number one, is learning the fine art, heart of standing up for the innate intrinsic rights of the human, you, me. We're born equal in freedom, in dignity, in conscience. It is not the role of government, to state the obvious, to dictate our freedom. And so averting overwhelm I would say the first state is remembrance and the activation of an ethical, spiritual, existential courage, an ecosystem of dignity that feels into and embodies and breathes the innateness of your own rightness, your own beauty, your own sovereignty, your own conscience, your own dignity, your choice, informed consent, starts obviously from within. And that's a quality of consciousness, that innateness. I am endowed with freedom of thought. No one can take my freedom from me unless I allow them to. So how do we embody, I mean, this is the way I go about it throughout the day, how well do I embody my innate qualities of consciousness? I often refer to my time in a monastery where we were encouraged so repeatedly, so beautifully, to, to embody a mindful grace, a mindful embodiment of the virtues 
that we would attribute to the meaning of Dhamma or Dharma, the virtues, the, the, the states of consciousness, of uprightness. There's something beautiful about being upright, physically upright, mentally upright, ethically upright, spiritually upright. It's not posturing at all. It's the innateness of the rightness of our own curiosity, our own wonderment, our own quest to adventure in this invenerating, wild, terrifying, beautiful field known as samsara in the Buddhist Pali language. I have a right to participate in my own consciousness on the terms of my own dignity, my own self-respect, my own self-love. That sense of mirroring back to oneself, not only the appropriateness or the suitability, but the embrace of flaws and all, as we are, who we are, where we are. And that level of meditative embodiment is a trans-postural, a trans-apartheid approach to, for me, of embodying not just averting overwhelm, but embodying, I would call it, dhamma wellness. And obviously it takes time and it's an art and it's a, it's a powerful conviction in your own innate holiness, if you will. But to take from that word the attributes of your own personal Bible, your own personal uh, holy pages, and anoint, breathe into learning the art of intimate experiential embodiment of the qualities that you worship in life, in books, in other, but to live in the embodiment of them, the direct experience of Dhamma in the moment. And how well do you move? How well do you reach? How well do you... I mean, I was out to dinner last night with a group of friends and it was a very dynamic, engaged space. And I was just noticing at times moving from thought streams and content to a type of architecture or physics of interrelatedness. How well was I listening? Or I would assess, trying without judgment, the quality of another person's capacity to engage or listen, watching and feeling mannerisms, bodily language, tonality, sensitivity, poise, suitability, spontaneity, playfulness, uh, the wellness of their own self-respect to embrace controversy or unexpected communication that may be easily felt as a type of trigger or judgment if one wasn't mindful. And that, that type of action through states as well as the dhamma or the lawfulness or the physics, the architecture of the cognitive interrelatedness of shared space. How well do we embody our wellness, our dharma wellness? Point one. I come back so frequently to the beauty, to the dignity, to the power of meditation. It just happens to be something that I treasure and honor and respect. It's very much a deliberate action at times of choosing to bathe or to shower, to shave, to anoint, and then to consecrate the day with the action of deliberate meditation. And what I mean by that for myself as a way to avert overwhelm, it's to 
for me to consecrate the day with the most sacred, call it prayer in action, meditation is prayer in dynamic felt action. So I sit to occupy not just present time phenomena felt inside through the senses back inside of itself or the perception of things coming to the sense doors from outside and the confluence of sense objects at the sense doors, but occupying very, very basic qualities that for me result in the radiance of empowerment. Um, facing myself. Some days aren't easy. Some hours are complicated. Facing myself without moving and just enlisting, employing, occupying the radiance of non-judgmental, highly nurturing awareness. Infiltrate, infuse, occupy, infiltrate, infuse, occupy the anatomical sensations of the body. Something so beautiful to just simply sit and mindfully feel the flow of changing physical sensations that are innate to the body, but easily lost as ground of dignity and conscience and being and wisdom through fusion with ideation through the senses. And we look out and hear out and smell out and taste out and we operate outside of our bodies. And it's very easy to be lost and stirred and moved and overwhelmed by the fusion within the thought stream phantasm of an event, of a person, of an idea, of a circumstance, of a destination, of a fear or a terror. And we live in the conceptualization of something and we often lose touch with the, I would say, the, the ground of our innateness, coming back into embodied dignity as basis of averting overwhelm. A very distinctive part of meditation, I know I'm saying things to people who probably very much know, but the ability to, to disavow the seduction to fuse with thought. Ah, I do not have to identify with the thought flow as it occurs. The coming and going of ideation, conceptualization, and all the various forms of thought that we know so well, but often either neglect or fear or aspire to have. And the next thing you know, we become our thoughts. So the way to overcome, for me, the sense of overwhelm is to, to use a psychological term, decathex, relax the gravitational innate hold on thought, relax the grasping, relax the attachment, not to vilify grasping, not to vilify attachment. How often I would watch, uh, one of my Kalyanamitas, the late Venerable Seda Upandita. He was such a, for me personally, a great Kalyanamita. And he would often encourage people to squeeze their hand. And he would say, this is very much the role of loba and moha, greed and delusion based upon 
a blind identification with an emotion or a thought. And if you want to practice the fine mental or dharma art of open-mindedness and to allow the freedom flow of cognitive sensation and ideation and emotionality to simply come and go and to study its characteristics and its functions, you just relax this innate proclivity to hold. And he would say, don't force the hand open. Don't force your attachment out of psyche. Don't force grasping out of consciousness. Simply relax the grasping. And he would ask them, Squeeze tighter so you can really feel the sensations. I do not want to die. You're defying cosmic biological reality with that thought. I don't want to experience harm, a beautiful prayer, but there's no guarantee that the thought can deliver the promise. We must be open and develop a higher degree of resilience and intelligence and wisdom, he would say. So we learn to relax one form of process and open to the multiplicity of deeper intelligences. And we must first learn to open the mind, to hear yourself, to hear someone else, relax this primordial attachment on food, on comfort, on beauty, on wealth, on status, on hope, on dreams. Yes, 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 courage is cool. Determination is beautiful. But if you're attached to fear, you live in the claustrophobia and you become overwhelmed. So relax. And he would encourage them, just simply don't open your hand, don't open your mind, just simply open on the terms of naturalness. Something so beautiful about naturalness to me. There's 10 million ways to walk, talk, make love, and drink, and eat, and move, and live. 8 billion, 100 billion, hundreds of billions and millions of possibilities. But what's unique about you and what's unique about me is that we have a uniqueness and to embrace that uniqueness is identical to naturalness to you. No two of us will do Dhamma alike. Wow, how cool, how authentic, how aesthetic. Uniquely relax your primordial hold, your grasping. And what would it feel like, he would encourage you. What does it feel like? Oh, and they would sometimes just feel a type of joy come across their face. There would be light. And sometimes some people would begin to cry because they could see the association between how innate this grasping was and how blind they were to this grasping. But by this simply, this simple exercise, they could see, oh my God, there's so many areas of my life that I feel like I'm innately just holding, 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 holding. And open-mindedness is so there every present moment to relax our primordial hold. So to practice naturalness and to release an open mind, to me, is another safeguard of overcoming overwhelm. Relaxing fear. Oh. <laughs> creative playfulness, rootedness and purpose. There's a, there's a sustaining strength that I personally feel in my own life from both conscious and unrecognizable associations with decades of choices. I feel a rootedness from the natural nutrients in the soil of my own being 
that I've clearly in my own heart feel like I've done the very best through the complexities I've encountered. There's a certain strength in that, a strength in character, a strength in principle, a strength in my own sense of choice making and ethical courage to stay as best as possible in virtue. And then of course learning a hard earned lesson is self-respect and self-forgiveness through mistake, foible, flaw. But my point is, is, is in that sense of movement throughout the day, the meditative embodiment of dignity and conscience and the uniqueness of my approach, there's a beauty in knowing that no matter what happens, I have done my very best throughout my discernible, mindful years to choose right over wrong, good over bad, peace over violence, forgiveness over condemnation. And so I bring this point up as another, I think, potent Dharma attribute of keeping at bay overwhelm and empowering us is mindful, conscious reflection about certain dimensions of one's own being. It's like a, a more engaged form of prayer that reflects personally upon your own process. How well have I over the last year chosen courage over conformity? How well have I chosen to extend my belongings and my time to others rather than to negate or neglect opportunities to give? How well have I listened when I know the other person is wrong and I've restrained blame and judgment to more understand and respect another person's process in determining how they come to truth rather than imposing my truth on them. To be able to reflect on the various ways in which we develop character and, and, and the features of our own, call it our own holiness, and in the area of generosity, in the area of ethical restraint, in the, ethic, in the reflection on the appropriateness of speech. I was saying last night to a friend, uh, one of the more inspiring forms of healing, which isn't a very common word that I use, I don't really use it frequently, but going right back to the classical Buddhist texts and equally how I was encouraged and how other nuns and monks were encouraged in the monasteries in Myanmar was in the, the, the sustaining power in the word truthfulness. Um, There's something so, I think, something so beautiful about knowing that your worth and your personal cognitive wealth is in your such a your your truthfulness, your 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 courageous, I want to use courageous self-honesty. And it minimizes exaggeration, it minimizes association with conceit and pride, it holds out in a way and reveals elements of narcissism, blindness, overestimation, and there's an innate humility in the empowerment of knowing 
truthfulness in our being to avert fear, anticipation of suffering, and the perception of emotional, psychological, existential overwhelm. And the Buddha's chief disciple attributed to these ancient texts, a gentleman known as Theraputta, and had a, a lifelong abdominal illness and his very dear friend, a fellow monk, who had special powers, special knowledge, uh, psychic skills, did not want to see his beloved friend Sariputta suffer any longer from the acute abdominal pain. Um, and he knew that there was a type of food, a, a rice gruel, that would quiet the pain. But as a nun or a monk, one can't ask for food. One must take what is offered freely. And so every day before noon, the nuns and monks walk through the villages or wherever there's food and simply allow those who choose to naturally offer dana or generosity through food and teas and medicines. They put them in the nun's bowls, and they put them in the monk's bowls. And so Sariputta's friend, as the story goes, brought forth through his power the ability to have a regular lay supporter who offered food on that day prepare this special rice gruel and to offer it to Sariputta. That's a whole other story about the exploration of psychic phenomena and the empowerment of the psychic intuitive. Um, personally, it's, it's a huge area of refuge for me right now. Um, another topic, another day. And so Sariputta was on alms round and was given this rice gruel. And I sometimes wonder the delight in Sariputta's mind to feel the synchronicity of, ah, I'm in this acute abdominal pain. And here is this rice gruel, how refined is the world and the universe and my karma to align in such a beautiful way, right? He went back and sat beneath the tree with his friend and his friend commented, Oh, I see you were given the special rice gruel. And he said, yes, it was offered freely, my friend. And then the monk who created the circumstance through psychic powers said, Sariputta, out of my love for you, my friend, I created the circumstance with the layman, prepared the gruel and offered it to you. I want to come back full circle with you with my honesty. There's something so magnificent about that. So pure, so sublime. Just the sacredness of that. Um, I would call it psychic communion as a safeguard for both sanity and anointing our lives despite the horrors with the nuministic, the beautiful, the holy. And Sariputta, it said in these ancient texts, said to his friend, oh, your intention is so noble. However, as monks, we must not create circumstances where we contrive the laity to provide food for us out of choice. We must take only what is offered freely. I cannot eat this in good conscience because you manipulated the man's consciousness. As beautiful as that manipula manipulation was. Very, very sublime alignment to virtue. 
This is nuns and monks, and not just nuns and monks, but that level of refined interior etiquette. I just love that. I mean, Da Aung San Suu Kyi is one for that. So many of the freedom fighters in Burma have such a refined interior, I would call it noble etiquette of decency. They're, they're, this, the word indomitable, they're being tortured, raped, some of them mercilessly tortured, forcing them to watch their family members go through this. Imagine the strength of character. We talk about overwhelm, dealing with a pandemic and health passes and the fear of the rise of the Fourth Reich and depopulation and mass extermination and the ineffectiveness of this so-called vaccine as it's becoming more and more, all the ways in which information is coalescing with misinformation and who to believe and the sense of perpetual anxiety that's arising in so many people. And how do you maintain, how do we maintain the virtue of, I dare use the word, an indomitable, no matter what, no matter what, keeping the sanctity of love alive. It's so rad that under these circumstances, it is the highest, most sacred opportunities to keep elevating and ascending and integrating and co-creating and evolving the most majestic qualities of being under pressure. And so Saraputta said, thank you, my friend, for your noble, gift, but in respect to our discipline as bhikkhus, monks, I must live in alignment to the vinaya, the code of discipline, alignment to the marrow of my ethics. If we were on a moderate dose of psychedelic or some cognitive enhancer, words like this would be vibrational poems in cognitive atmospheres where we could look and feel and smell and taste and move around these interior formations of co-creative consciousness. living in that dynamic and heightening the ability to be fearless in those dynamics is an issue to me of respect for ethical, spiritual, existential intelligence. That's all I'm pointing to here is, is the beauty of that, dignity reinventing the intelligence and the root systems of our dignity. I sometimes think about, I'll finish the story with Saraputta, of, of Holocaust survivors. I was recently looking into a remarkable woman, a, a child Holocaust survivor, I think her name is Vera Sharar, Vera Sharar. And she's been a long time, you might have heard about her, a long time activist, advocate of understanding how the Holocaust obviously was a genocide, but what distinguished that genocide from other genocides was how it was fully supported, almost exclusively supported in its emergence through the medical, the medical professionals of Germany. And she has been speaking about it for 
decades and even more so now when we're seeing the conflation of of this pandemic and and biological well-being and our own personal choice to health and doctor's role of no harm and seeing each being as a separate entity to co-creatively work with her and him for their own unique expression of health and well-being. And so this the persecution of society through the doctors and mental medical health professionals. They that was the emergence long before the the paramilitary and the mass shooting of deplorables and Jews up to 20, 30,000 in a day or two. And that became so tedious for the German paramilitary. They eventually, I think it was in 1940, used and moved the genocide to, to gas chambers. But for years prior, it was the employment of medical tyranny that began to manipulate the people and begin to extract from society the so-called undesirables and the mandatory use of vaccines. I mean, it's like, it's scary to look at the, the parallels and you wonder, is there like a, a cabal of others using the 1933 to 1938 medical tyranny playbook out of the emergence of the Third Reich in Nazi Germany to today. And it's like, my God, she certainly thinks so. She's sounding the alarm. Take the blinkers off. Snap out of the coma of obedience. I mean, that's another way to protect ourselves from overwhelm is to snap out of the coma of obedience. <laughs> obedience disobey, civil disobedience, right? I'll get into that. I'll get back to Sarah Puta. And, but she was making the point that there were the Nuremberg trials that we're very well aware of with the Nazi commandants. But how many of us remember, I think it was 23 German medical doctors that were also tried at Nuremberg, medical doctors. And she went on to say that there were hundreds, if not thousands more that never were tried, that remained post-World War II, post-Holocaust, post-genocide, who were deeply colluding with Hitler and the Third Reich. These medical professionals lived on, practiced on, and carried on and became even celebrated post-World War II Germany. And she made, what's this gentleman's name? Dr. Hans Suring, Dr. Hans Suring, who wasn't one of the 23 German doctors tried in the medical Nuremberg, but was one of the thousand others who was traced to, this is just one small statistic, where he took, was it 900 deformed just even the word, deformed Catholic children. Where was he in Dachau? Imagine you're the doctor, the parents are gone of 900 Catholic children, 900 Buddhist children, 900 Jewish children, 900 Christian children, 900 atheists, uh, 900 people from the island of Maui, 900 children who had been taken from parents 
and were seen now as, because they were handicapped, in the eugenics model, which was used by Hitler in the Third Reich, rooted in Darwinian theory of evolution, to remove the eugenic, to remove the undesirable biological elements. Humans were reduced to biological organisms. And the idea of the innate right of the human to their own sanctity, the sacredness of the human was destroyed by the medical profession in Germany. They were reduced to biological organisms to experiment on, as we know, that medical tyranny was the, is what preceded the mass shootings and eventually the deportations and eventually the exterminations. And so we're seeing these type of things and this, this gentleman, Dr. Hans Suring, led those 900 Catholic children to their death through medical experimentations to serve the emergence of the Third Reich. Could we be seeing things like this today? Certainly the luminous child Holocaust survivor, Vera Sharva, thinks so. Now let me just, I brought this thing out, read it. I wasn't, it's a quote of hers from nearly a, dec, uh, a decade ago. And it's being reused by a, a senator. And it's short, and she's, She's saying something where she says, government dict this is 10 years ago, government dictated medical interventions undermine our dignity as well as our freedom. Medical mandates, now mind you, this is 10 years ago, medical mandates are a major step backward down the slippery slope toward a fascist dictatorship and the equivalent of crematoriums. The stark lesson of the Holocaust is that when doctors join forces with government and deviate from their personal and professional ethical commitment to, quote, do no harm to the individual, medicine can be weaponized. A eugenics-based racial ideology perverts the healing profession into a murderous apparatus. Wow. Find that quote, let it go viral, literally, to confront the virus and the medical tyranny of do as I say, rather than my oath to do no harm. And she said a few years later, this is her other quote, in 2019, New York State eliminated the legal status of religious exemptions. This is a dictatorial process. It is eerily reminiscent of the infamous 1935 Nuremberg racial laws that eliminated the rights of citizenship to Jews. Orthodox Jewish children and their parents who refused to comply with the vaccination schedule were vilified and ostracized from public places as, quote, disease spreaders. The unvaccinated are killing us. And it's it's shrilling to the core of my identity. And ethics is my point here, coming right back to Sariputta. He poured out the rice gruel that could heal him. And in that act 
of courageous restraint, the power of that conviction in his ethics and his dignity, it said in the ancient Buddhist texts that he was instantaneously healed from this lifelong illness. The power of ethical intelligence and the courage to live within our moral wisdom. Something so beautiful about that at this time. To avert overwhelm, like a tree, we root. Regardless of the wind and the rain and the darkness, to state the obvious, we're rooted. Our wings, our limbs, our leaves, our hair, our clothes may breeze and blow. We may even be stripped like a Jesus on the cross and mocked, mocked by society and others, evildoers, killers, denigrating zealots, misinformation peddlers, cancel, cancel, whatever. We have examples of Sariputta, of the Buddha, Mary Magdalene, Jesus, no matter where we are, even the most heinous criminals, I do believe in redemption. I'll close here. And as a safeguard in my own sanctity, in my own sanity, in my, my moral belligerence at times, I do believe in the innateness of the good. I do believe that I'm a light bearer I do believe that I anoint myself in my own humble, crazy, mad way as being a rebel, holy madman. Maybe you, a holy, crazy, mad woman. To go wild in this strange, invinerating oddity called life and to live so outrageously in our creative civil disobedience and our creative expression of hope. Those two things as a way to avert overwhelm. The crazy radical act of civil disobedience. Let us stand not up to power and authority. Let us live in the radicalization of being disobedient to false narratives of conformity and tyranny and violence. Let our lives be expressions, not of nonviolence alone, but of creative unwillingness to participate in lies, in conformity, in strange agreements that denigrate. And finally, like last night, I wish you were there at dinner with us beautiful event. And we were going around the table based upon the gentleman who hosted us, Matthew. How could our lives, our individual choices of civil disobedience intersect with the big issues of like he brought up in my case, how does it affect and change the role of dictatorship in Burma? How could it release Da Aung San Suu Kyi from the persecution of this, these Orwellian evildoers? How could it change the mind of President Biden? How could it interrupt the, the, the xenophobic, imperialistic narcissism of the nuclear armed, bioweapon driven dictator Xi Jinping of China? What can we do? And I proposed my humble approach would be to have a weekly salon, soiree, dinner event infused with all the various things that all of us who were there felt were appropriate to anoint the space, to illuminate consciousness in a more vulnerable, open, expansive, adventurous, creative exploration of possibility 
for a nuclear mind bomb as well as a humble event of naked, intimate sensitivity and silence and possibly even just breathing and crying together. To put three, four, five cameras with microphones and good lighting and film the event and just simply safeguard the beauty of a dinner with Matthew a revolutionary act of creative civil disobedience. We don't need workshops and gurus and teachers and books. What we need is natural reality being played at the forefront of human beings at the edges of our own act of living consciously. I'm a media driven person. And I said, wow, that would be a very interesting idea. And it struck an act of Sariputta, the ethical intelligence of, hmm, that sounds interesting and it may come to be to have a series of anti-Netflix dinners with Matthew, with this illustrious group of crazy, radical, sexy, smart, mad women, men, dinner events infused with the translucent psychedelic and consciousness and intimacy and trying the best that we can to live creatively to create an event that just relaxes the tyranny and the fear and the persecution and what looks to be the rise of this crazy thing called a fourth reich I want my daughter and her children. I want the children. I want the birds, the animals, and I want a future for life. There will be one. But I want it to be as easy and sacred and free of suffering as possible. So to close today, thank you from my heart. Think of the ways in which you can empower your own set of qualities to avert overwhelm and to empower the most beautiful, dignified, creatively, civil, disobedient, activist oriented qualities of love. Keep love, health, use your life to be healthier. Do everything to maintain and elevate physical, emotional and spiritual health. Do what you need to do medically. Do it consciously. At the same time, keep on keeping on. Think creatively, refuse tyranny, refuse demands, learn the fine, courageous, cool, sexy art of disobeying lies and false authority. Look deeper into information that seems even true to see if it's misinformed, cognitive bias, and be open-minded, as Seda Upandita said. Keep on keeping on. So from my heart to yours, have a beautiful day. God willing, see you tomorrow. And um, keep your beauty active. So from my heart to yours, thank you.